it's still pretty early in the morning, but um, this may be the last thing between you and going home tonight. So appreciate you all taking the time. Um, just to give you some quick background, my name is Zach Ratner, and I have some pretty exciting background on AI to share with you all today. There's so much going on in this space right now, and I'm personally interested in sharing why I am so optimistic about it. And I hope to leave you all with some practical tips that you can take back to your desks, back to your jobs, and hopefully be a bit more optimistic about the future that AI is bringing to us today. Some quick background on myself and why I'm here. I am the Chief Technology Officer and one of the two co-founders at Yembo.ai. We're a computer vision company founded in 2016, and we are building a digital home profile for the home services industry. So if you're getting a relocation quote, if you're getting property insurance, these kinds of things are typically really difficult to price and estimate because you need to have an expert go inside the home, look around at what's there and identify things. And that's what our computer vision technology does. So by recording quick videos of the interiors of people's homes, we can provide itemized inventory lists into what's moving and not moving. We can make reconstruction estimates based on measurements for property insurance companies, flooring, painting quotes, all those kinds of things. So we've been in business for about seven years. We've processed several million videos, got customers in about 20 countries all over the world. And as of last year, I've become an author. Um, I wrote a book called Grow Up Fast, Lessons from an AI Startup, where I share the key lessons that I've learned from my seven years of founding and running an AI company. Um, I'm an engineer by training. I have 19 granted UF patents. I'm in the top 2% of Stack Overflow, which is a popular engineering blog. And I'm one of the top AI voices on LinkedIn. Um, all that said, I tried really hard to make this presentation not be super technical. So it's not intended only for technical audiences. I think what AI is doing in the industry is changing a lot of different things. And um, that said, it's not supposed to be a textbook. You don't need to bring out your calculators or your pencils. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, at the end of it, walk away with um, some tangible things that you can take back to your desk and do a little bit differently when you get back to your, uh, to your offices after this. Just taking a step back before we dive into AI, I think um, it's worth looking at, we're in the midst of one of the largest periods of industrial, of change since the industrial revolution. Um, you could argue maybe the change that AI is bringing is even greater than the industrial revolution. I think like all periods before, um, this one was sparked by a world changing invention. This time around is not the steam engine, it's not the printing press, but it's AI. And I think AI is a bit different from the periods before because the technology is oftentimes intangible. It sits off in a data center, off in a cloud somewhere, and it'll sift through large reams of data. It'll give us suggestions. It'll act on our behalf. It'll make things to our specifications. If you were to walk down Main Street in a town before and after the Industrial Re Revolution, the effects would have been super clear. You would have been able to see obvious changes in terms of how people were working, um, what kind of stores were there. But with AI, the shift is a bit more subtle but I would argue it's no less powerful. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today. And um, I have some examples of like how AI is changing the world and overall some practical suggestions on things that you can do to take it back to your desk and, um, and do things a little bit differently. So before we look to the future, let's take a step back and look where it all started. So imagine the year is 1945. And the U.S. Army has just commissioned the University of Pennsylvania to build a machine for performing ballistics computations. This was during World War II. The machine that was built was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, um, or ENIAC as an acronym. And this was the world's first programmable computer. It looked nothing like a computer today, um, but the press called it a giant brain. It took up about 1,800 square feet, and it was powered by so many vacuum tubes that when you turned it on, the lights in the neighborhood would dim because it sucked so much power. It was programmed not by keyboards, but by physically unplugging and plugging in wires and flipping switches, which is what you're seeing here in this photo. And this is where the etymology of the modern term programmer comes from. It was initially people who were plugging wires and flipping switches. The work, as you might imagine, was not particularly glamorous. It was considered to be clerical work, where the folks who designed the computers was a kind of like the more desirable job at the time, um, but this is how it all started. And by the time the machine was retired in 1955, after 10 years of service, this computer had performed more calculations 
than all human beings in all of history beforehand. So it's easy to look back at it now and say it's so primitive, but uh, remembering where it was at the time that it came, I feel like it's pretty key. By today's standards, you probably can't do anything with this computer. It would be woefully inadequate. I can't even imagine if you wanted to make like a simple web page or respond to an email, how many of these programmers it would take to put it together, but you have to start somewhere. And I think this is a good analogy for, for AI, is as humans make progress over time, there's an inflection point that happens where the pace of progress generally picks up dramatically fast. Humans don't just make linear plotting progress over time. But the problem is, as human beings, if you're standing where that dot is in the timeline, you can only see what's come behind you. And it's really hard for us as, um, as humans to anticipate this huge amounts of change that's coming. Um, and to someone who is just looking back, you can look like you're making a lot of plotting progress overall. Um, but I think overall, we've come a long way since this computer has come out. We've um, certainly seen a lot in AI in the past couple of years even. And I believe we are here in the timeline where things haven't even really started picking up yet. So why is it that everybody's talking about AI all of a sudden? I've got three quotes from three prominent trillion plus dollar companies. Um, and I can't remember the last time all three of these folks agreed on something. But in the last year, CEOs of Google, Apple, and Microsoft have all mentioned that they're going all in on AI. When the MP3 player was the dominant tech gadget in Silicon Valley, uh, Microsoft laughed at it for a while and they came out with the Zune and then we all know how that kind of ended up. Um, similar with the smartphone, it wasn't really like a given that this was a, a wave of technology that was worth riding. But in the last year alone, everybody seems to agree on one thing, and that is that AI is here and it's for real and they're banking their company strategies on it. So why is that? I think if you take a step back and just look kind of overall, there are three main forces that are leading to AI's rise today. First off, there's the increase in computing power. If you walk into an Apple store and buy a laptop, that machine is incredibly sophisticated. It's not marginally better than something that you could have bought maybe five or 10 years ago. It's orders of magnitude better. I mean, most of us use these machines to catch up on email, watch Netflix, maybe message each other, but the raw power available allows you to run more and more sophisticated algorithms. On top of that, we have a huge prolifer proliferation of data. In the 1990s, when the internet was nascent, the major print media companies got websites and they started broadcasting their content out to people. But then in the 2000s, we had this concept of web 2.0, where Facebook let everybody upload pictures of themselves and their friends. Twitter let anybody comment on what was going on in the news. And we had this rise of user-generated content. Then on top of that, we have improvements in algorithms where the increase in computing power, more and more data becoming available, it encourages researchers to experiment and tinker and, and do new things. So you put these things together and you have a fertile environment for algorithms to be experimented on and the cost to do them just keeps coming down year over year over year. So if you go and read the news right now, there's certainly a lot of buzz around where AI is going and why it seems like you can't really avoid it. But I think the main thing to keep in mind is we are at this inflection point. So I did some research and found um, kind of mankind's greatest hits if you were to take like top 10 inventions. But the part that's really interesting is if you look at this timeline, it's not to scale. Just about half of a percent of the overall timeline is within a human's lifetime. You starting at ag agriculture 12,000 years ago. This is kind of incredible because that means if you were born, say, 5,000 years ago, your life maybe wouldn't be looked that different to someone plus or minus 500 years. But if you were born in 1990 versus 2000 versus 2010, just the pace of progress has picked up so much that things that used to take century, centuries to deliver are now only taking months. And this causes us to rethink a lot of things and it causes us to have new uh, opportunities and things that are available now that were laughably inadequate or impossible before. To put this into scale, this first computer that we spoke about, the ENIAC in 1945, could do a little bit under 3000 calculations per second. Fast forward a couple of decades, the Apollo lander that put man on the moon could do 40,000. 
But still, by today's standards, this is a joke. I don't know if anybody recognizes this device down on the bottom, but this was a, a kid's toy in the 90s, at least here in the United States, the Tamagotchi. That Tamagotchi was about as powerful as four of the Apollo landers that put men on the moon. And imagine what your smartphone can do today, what your laptop can do today. So this is the pace of how quickly things are picking up. So there were these concepts that came from science fiction decades ago, but with things that are advancing this quickly, you're able to achieve things and experiment and attempt things that were impossible before. These are all um, kind of abstract examples. So I looked a little bit at um, something that we probably have on our desks. And if you were to go into an Apple store over the decades, the machine that you can buy today for about 1200 US dollars is 16 million times more powerful than that first ENIAC that helped the allies win World War II. So this is really difficult, I think, to wrap our heads around. I think as, um, as humans, it's maybe easy to understand that something is 10% bigger, twice as large, but 16 million times more is kind of mind blowing. Um, and it's just a point to illustrate how much um, availability we have of these resources to be able to go and tackle new and bigger problems. So what does this mean for all of our productivity? Well, tasks that were impossible to automate can be near instantaneous today, and the cost to do it can be very cheap. When you run a um, query to a large language model like ChatGPT, I don't know if folks here have tried the tool or not, um, but a study was done and showed that it costs about 87 cents in compute power for a typical session. So that means when you go and ask ChatGPT to um, like brainstorm some ideas for you or give you feedback on something, that on average, you're um, racking up a little bit less than a dollar in a bill for the OpenAI's cloud provider. But keeping in mind that trajectory of how computers have changed, if this had happened 10 years ago, you'd maybe be looking at 20 or $80. So these things that would be completely infeasible before are near free now. I would argue most of the world isn't really aware of this, nor are they equipped. So there's an opportunity for all of us here being among the first, trying to figure out how do we rewrite the rules? What does productivity look like in the future? And I would argue a lot of these rules are up for debate right now. There's no one expert who knows everything. Nobody has it all sorted out. And I think this is really an exciting time to be alive and the time to be in this industry because we're able to shape how we want the future of work to be. I wanted to give a little bit more background on AI in general. Um, there are a lot of buzzwords out there. I don't want to be too technical, but this is a talk about AI. So I just need to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I had a couple um, images to kind of go along with some terminology. And I think it'll be helpful as we go into, into uh, the next section of the talk. So I think we've all heard the phrase an algorithm. That's kind of the top level superset of all of this. You can think of it as a series of steps that, an that a computer can follow. So when you wash the dishes at night, you are actually following an algorithm. It's not particularly uh, complex, at least for me it's not, um, but it involves step one, take the soap, step two, put it on the sponge, step three, rinse the dish, step four, put the soap on the sponge on the dish, rub it, rinse it, put it away. There's a sequence of steps that you can follow, you can document, you can hand off to somebody else and they can follow those steps. And that's what makes it an algorithm. Inside of that, there's this concept of artificial intelligence which is a class of algorithms that reason like humans do. And those are things that bring us theory, for instance, it can listen, it can speak, and it kind of behaves like a human would. Um, there's object detection where you can look around a room, identify what's there, like what we do at Yumbo. Um, and it's a family of algorithms that's intentionally modeled after human behavior. Inside of that, there's this concept of machine learning, which is a type of AI algorithm where the approach is trained on examples and data. So for instance, a, the way that you would detect maybe a cat or a dog from, from a camera 20 years ago is totally different than what we do today. Um, with, uh, with machine learning, you can give examples of these are cats, these are dogs, and the algorithms can learn. That's why it's called learning, is it's able to look at these examples and decide for itself based on the examples you give what makes a cat a cat and a dog a dog. Traditionally, before that happened, the engineer was on their own. They would need to decide for themselves 
um, what makes a cat a cat and a dog a dog. And as a result, the algorithms weren't very scalable. If you spent all this time detecting a cat, it wouldn't go then and detect a chair. But with machine learning, you're able to have all these examples and it learns on its own, which is much more powerful because if you want to detect chairs and you have a cat detector, you just swap out the data, change the labels, and away you go. Deep learning gives the ability to um, detect more complex tasks. I don't want to go into too much detail and bore you all with the technical um, jargon, but this is a, a dominant form of doing machine learning tasks today. Inside of that, it kind of unlocks two main use cases. I categorize them as perception tasks, which is observing an environment. So things like computer vision, looking around, using a camera, identifying things, speech recognition, listening to audio, detecting what is spoken, who is speaking, different sounds, language processing, kind of understanding the sentiment and what people are saying, pulling out meaning from, from words, and then fusing different sensors, either for things like self-driving cars, where it may not just be a camera, but you maybe have other sensors that you're trying to put all together. So perception algorithms allow algorithms to perceive the world and reason like a human would. And on the flip side, we have generation, which is where the algorithms are actually creating things. So for example, um, we'll go into an example on GANs afterwards that talks about how um, AI can create images. Um, transformers, if you use ChatGPT, the T in transformer is an example of that, where it's generating sequences of words that you can read in a sentence. And diffusers are a similar, similar class of algorithm that actually let you create things. Um, perception is a bit older. It was kind of the first set of tasks that came out when deep learning kind of had its heyday in 2012-13 era. And generation has been the last two, three years or so where everyone's been um, kind of focusing on image generation, text generation. But overall, you look at these two families, these are the kinds of things that AI can do well with the current state of the art. Because it's pretty decent at detecting things and pretty decent at, at generating certain areas. I think this is a good point to pause if folks have any questions. Um, wanted to just make sure I'm not losing anyone with the terminology here. Any questions for anyone? I'll just check the chat. Cool. All right. Well, if there are no questions, I'll go on. And I have a little bit of an exercise that um, I think if you can run through it with me in your head, I, um, with it being on Zoom, I usually like to call people out of the audience for this part, but since we're on Zoom, I think um, it might be easier if you try to follow along and I'll tell you at the end what the right answers are. But I wanted to zoom into this concept of GANs um, because I think it's really important to illustrate what AI can do well, and it also has limitations. Um, we're gonna get into soon the 10 reasons that I am optimistic. Um, so I think this example is helpful. So the concept of GANs, it's a type of technology that's used to create images. And that stands for generative adversarial networks. And the way it works is it actually has two different algorithms inside of it that compete with each other. So there's a generator, which creates images, and there's a discriminator, which looks at the image and makes a decision based off of it. So if you want to say, create an image of a hot air balloon, what a GAN would do is you'd show it a bunch of examples of images. And the generator's job is to try to create an image that tricks the discriminator. So it's going to try to make an image that looks like a hot air balloon that makes the discriminator think that it's a real image, even though it's fake. And then the discriminator's job is to try to decide which one's real, which one's fake. And then there's feedback involved where it learns whether it was right or wrong and they repeat. So when you, if you want to make a, an AI algorithm that can detect or it can create images of hot air balloons, it goes through this process for thousands or hundreds of thousands of iterations. And just like with people where practice makes perfect, you do this a bunch of times and eventually the generator gets really good at generating, the discriminator gets really good at discriminating and you'll find the end result um, is about 50-50. That's usually when you stop training, when the, when the generator is no longer able to um, kind of get any better and the discriminator basically can't tell was this real or was this fake. So if you were to go try to train, these are just some representative examples. One of them is real, one of them is fake. And I think if you spend any amount of time looking at it, it's pretty obvious which one is the fake one. And then you give the feedback. So obviously here, the one on the right 
is is the one that's fake. Then you go on to the next one that learns the feedback. It um, enhances, it gets a little bit better. Um, this one, the one on the left is uh, is the fake one. You can see there's still a little couple weird things around the shadows, around the trees. The scale's a little bit funky. I think the, the balloon might hit the tops of the trees if that were real. Um, but eventually it gets pretty good. And when you get to the end, um, this is when you stop training, when you have these items that uh, that it's not really distinguishable anymore. So this one, the, the one on the right is a real photo, the one on the left is, is not real. But as you go through and do that, I think it's important to highlight that the algorithm has no idea about hot air balloons or flight or beautiful sunsets. It's just learning from the data that's there. It's not really piecing together concepts like humans did to take the idea of internal combustion engines and gliders and end up with airplanes. It's just looking at examples and saying, I was told this looks like a hot air balloon, or I was told this looks like a cat or whatever it is. So that means that these things, they look really powerful, but they can only really look back in time. The algorithms that I've seen today and the, just understanding the way that the technology is going, I personally think we're far away off before computers can do everything that humans can. It's great for mimicking and things like this, but in terms of reasoning, piecing together new concepts and creating new ones, we've got a long ways to go. I think it uh, this reasonably mimics um, things that have already been done, but we're not at a point where we can start piecing together these concepts and inventing and creating new things. It's more, more of an efficient tool for, for doing this kind of work. But it does raise some important questions. If we live in a society where there's an advanced AI and most cognitive tasks can outperform humans, what use do we have for the humans? Will AI lead to the loss of human perspective? Will culture be all come the same? If we're all just asking chat GPT questions, then our blog posts, our social media, the discourse, the news we read, um, is there going to be variation there? And then what happens to creativity? Drilling into that a little bit more, will innovation become easy? Um, if you were all startup founders here or adjacent to folks who are starting companies. Um, and I think it's important to remember when you're innovating, the deck is stacked against you. The way the world works is a certain way. There are incumbents that benefit from the world working that way. So momentum's not generally on your side. So if you're coming up with a new way to do something, a different way to do something, it's not really enough to be incrementally better. You generally need to be 10 times better than the status quo to overcome that inertia and incentivize people to want to change. And if you look at case study after case study of what it takes to be effective at this, I would argue there are still some very human abilities required. The ability to motivate people, to be persuasive, to look at outcomes. These are all things that AI could maybe help you prepare for, but um, I don't know the last time someone here was had their mind changed by AI or was able to uh, like uh, have an outcome persuaded or swayed as a result of it. So I would argue that innovation doesn't go down to zero. Um, but there are tools that can make it easier for the person who's doing the innovating work. And that leads us to our 10 reasons to be optimistic. And I'll start it off with reason number one. I think the first thing to bear in mind, work is not zero sum. In a zero sum world, there are a fixed amount of tasks to be done. And if I take a job, that means that someone else is not able to get it. So by allocating one in a certain direction, you're subtracting away from somebody else. It's a convenient metaphor, um, but looking at his history, it's simply not how the world works. As technical change comes in and alters the way that we work, it can be scary seeing certain skill sets no longer being needed or emphasis being placed on new ones. But the key part to remember is that work is not zero sum. The consulting giant McKinsey did a study and observed that 10% of jobs each decade didn't exist in the previous decade. I think if you look around this room, we've got what, 10 or so folks. I mean, somebody here is doing something that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that's because, moving on to number two, technical progress has a way of working that generally raises the standards of people around them. I don't know much about pumping Freon, but I do certainly benefit from air conditioning. And if you go back in time and you look at how ancient royalty lived, um, just for fun, pick the Pharaoh Khufu. He lived about 4,500 years ago. He commissioned the Great Pyramids and he was on top of his game in ancient Egypt. If you look at his life, most of it was actually plagued by inconveniences. 
Today's working class, we have access to transportation with cars, airplanes. We have communication with smartphones, climate control, modern medicine. On paper, we're maybe not as rich as the Pharaoh was, but in absolute terms, we are wealthy beyond his imagination. And that's because the technical progress raises these standards. As humans, we make a great invention. Other people benefit from it. Eventually, it becomes commoditized, and we take it for granted. And mentally, we don't really hold space in our mind for things about like how Freon works. We just assume it's going to be comfortable inside, even if it's a hot summer day. It might sound a bit entitled to think about things this way, but I'd argue that all human progress kind of depends on this. We only have so much space in our brains and being able to free up certain things so we can focus on other areas is how you make forward progress. So when we see the change that AI is bringing along, it's important to bear in mind that the, in the past, progress has consistently shown this tendency to raise standards. There's a famous saying attributed to Thomas Edison. I don't know if he actually said it or not, um, but that's that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Well, thanks to AI, the perspiration just got a lot easier. There was a 2019 study that the US Navy performed where they looked at the type of work being done among their crew members, and they wanted to highlight what traits caused the top performers to outshine their peers. If you look historically, the crew on a ship was dominated by specialists, people that would start at the entry level, hone their craft, get really good at it, climb the ranks, get promoted, and then hire more people who filled in those gaps and kind of did the same things. But what they noticed was more recently, the top performers were actually replaced by generalists, not specialists for the first time. They observed that street smarts were starting to win out over book smarts and they wanted to understand why. In a relatively static world where the rules don't really change, it makes sense to devote decades to mastering a trade. But when the world's facing rapid change, adaptability and the eagerness to learn become more important. So the jobs that it takes to become successful didn't exist when the workers are in school. So using these findings, the Navy was able to operate a ship with only 40 members. And if you compare that to World War II era, it was about 300 to 400 people who would be manning the ship. It's about 10, tenfold improvement there. And in the conclusion of the study, they said, the rules keep changing, which means that the highly focused practice has a much lower return on investment in your time. So that means that all of this work that it goes in to master something, to get really good at it, to learn how to be proficient, how to, um, if you're doing, if you're a founder, if you're learning how to do sales for the first time, or you're learning on product development, that the ability to dive into a new area, become proficient, that's valuable, that's important, and that's becoming easier. And that's pretty hard to do without um, something like AI. Think about the last decision you made at work. Maybe it was to bring on a new employee. Maybe it was a tough vendor negotiation. Who did you consult with? Maybe you did it alone. Maybe you discussed it with a few peers. But AI lets us bring in intelligent agents who can reason with us, who can act on our behalves. And we're in the infant stages of this today, but you can already realize the benefits. If anyone here has tried the large language model, ChatGPT or Claude, um, you can ask it questions. Say, I'm thinking about doing X. What are the things that could go wrong that I should be on the lookout for? And the ability to kind of live in a simulated world and think things through and try them out before you go and actually do them can re dramatically reduce the barrier to entry and go through and help us have more thought out decisions. So we are in a time of unparalleled change, but these risks that we face, we have more tools and we can mitigate them a bit more easily. On top of that, if you look at the way that we do work today, a lot of habits needed to be revisited anyway, for being honest here. Um, there's a lot of talk about income inequality. What are we going to do with, um, with AI? And rather than slicing up the pie of the world that exists today and allocating it in a certain way, we can define these rules in an era of abundance where AI is creating more opportunities and helping us do more things. Um, I've seen personally arise in this concept of the solopreneurs, where they are an individual founder who's running a business entirely by themselves. They generally use things like no code tools, they have websites, they have um, chatbots helping them with customer support, they use um, ChatGPT for keyword research, and these tasks that used to just take a team of people, maybe five or ten people, are possible to be done with just one. 
And I would argue that makes more ideas, more um, products hitting the market, doesn't take things away. But it allows us to have these debates out in public with policymakers, with, um, with larger corporations. And we're able to do it with a tool in our back pocket, as opposed to just what's allocating what's already there. Kind of digging into the example of the hot air balloon, the areas where AI excels, it really excels at. It's awesome. But these are areas generally where humans tend to struggle. And I think the future leaves a way for both of these to um, benefit from each other. If you look at common software as a service tools that excelled in the last 10 years or so, a lot of them focused on giving recommendations, looking at data and saying, um, Google Analytics, hey, people are spending more time on this page than that page, or um, keyword research, focusing on different areas of your product that um, maybe your competitors are focusing on that you're not. But in the future, AI is allowing us to give recommendations and say, do this for me, as opposed to, here's a bunch of information, isn't that neat, and you draw your own conclusions. So you don't really have to be a data analyst to benefit from the reams of data that we have. Um, which project would you rather ask your boss to work on? Option A, please read all these contracts that we signed in the last year. Note down all the ones where the governing law is outside the USA. AI is awesome at that. I'd argue we'd all get bored. Number two, which market should we go into next? AI can help you, it can assist, but going back to that hot air balloon example, it's not really piecing things together and creating new things. So this means that we're able to be freed up to focus on those bigger questions, like what market should we go into next? And the tasks around um, reviewing the legal contracts maybe becomes a lot easier and doesn't take up as much of our brain space as it once did. Which leads us to seventh point, which is that AI fills a need where the alternative is nothing. There's so many details about our modern worlds that are designed around scarcity. If you go in a school, there's usually one teacher for every 20 to 30 students. If you go, need to go see a therapist, the cost is often $100 or $200 an hour. If you go to a doctor and you need to go see a specialist, it's not uncommon, at least here in the States, to need to wait months to actually be able to go see them. But with AI, we're able to bring in this mindset of abundance and change these things. So what if in the education world, you had an infinitely patient tutor they had office hours 24 seven, they understood your personal learning styles and preferences, and you could ask it questions without having to deal with the embarrassment of asking silly questions. You'd still have a teacher, but now you can practice as well and refine things on your own. For counseling, what if the cost of quality advice came down to near zero? How many more people could be affected by it? And in the doctor's example, people lie to doctors. Um, there's a common question here when you get a checkup in the States, how many drinks do you have a week? Um, I'd be curious to see how many people tell the honest truth there. So maybe AI can provide the cure to shame here. And there are so many research papers coming out, so much information to keep on top of that. Um, I have a friend who's a doctor who said, if all I did was read the studies that were coming out in my field, I'd never be able to see any patients because there's just not enough time in a day. So AI can help us with all of these things. And you still have a place for the humans, but the alternative to not using AI in these scenarios is nothing. And that's the interesting part about creating new opportunities is uh, people I think generally are fearful of AI taking where the alternative is a person doing the job, but the opportunities I see opening up are the alternative being, being nothing. And it brings this important concept that I like to call baseline proficiency. In order to do most tasks in business, you generally don't need to be the best in the world at that particular task. There's usually a couple areas where you really do need to be the best, but for most tasks, you need to be competent or baseline proficient. And AI can help you get to baseline proficiency in new areas faster. To give a quick example, the first job that I ever had was at a sandwich shop when I was 15 years old. When I joined, I had to spend two weeks learning all the different sandwich types, how to use the equipment, what kinds of customizations we could and couldn't do, how to interact with the customers. The job wasn't particularly esoteric or difficult to learn, but you needed to get the details right to be effective. It was an entry level minimum wage job, but still it took two weeks to get to baseline proficiency where I couldn't really effectively do my job before then. 
one of the biggest lessons I learned pretty early on was with the toaster. We had this big commercial grade toaster and it had a conveyor belt that would drag the bread or bagel or whatever through and toast it as it went. And one time this customer came in and he asked for his bagel to be super dark was his request. Sometimes people came in and asked for their bagels to be double toasted. But after I ran it through twice and showed it to him, he told me he wanted it triple toasted. Turns out if you triple toast in that particular toaster, halfway down the conveyor belt, the bagel will actually light on fire. And you will see um, this ring of fire coming out of the bagel. And there is absolutely nothing you can do apart from awkwardly looking at it and waiting for it to flip over at the end of the conveyor belt and extinguish itself. Afterwards, when that happened, um, my manager updated the employee handbook and said, under no circumstances are you ever to toast a bagel more than twice. Twice is the max you could put it through. It's a lesson I'll never forget, even a couple decades later, but everyone else who was at that job needed to learn that lesson as well. So that concept of baseline proficiency of adding more and more work to people, and um, it just takes extra time to, to stay on top of all of it. But in the era of AI, I can give another example where it sped things along. We recently had to do a video shoot at my company. We had a new product we were launching. The engineering was actually a little bit ahead of schedule. So we were done a little bit before we realized or we anticipated being ready. And our design team wasn't available yet. They had another project they were still working on. So we talked about pros and cons and we decided that it was better to make the video earlier rather than waiting a couple of months as we initially had scheduled. But that meant that I was going to have to do the video shoot myself. I am not a videographer. I went to engineering school. Um, I have a cell phone, I take pictures, but that's about it. And in order to do this video shoot, our design team had coursework. They had a, uh, an online course that they recommended I go through and said, okay, here's how you set up the lighting. Here's how you handle microphones. Here's how you establish a scene all this really good information if you're interested in becoming a full-time filmmaker. I just wanted baseline proficiency. I didn't intend to win any design awards, but I wanted to do a good enough job so that we could go to market and we could ex communicate to our client base the product that we were building. So what I did was I took the, that coursework. I used a tool called Whisper. I transcribed it, went into ChatGPT and summarized it. And on the day of the shoot, I had the notes app open on my phone with the top bullet points of the things that are, were really important to get right. I didn't take all four hours or so to go through the course. I didn't take the test at the end. And if you were to quiz me on it, I probably wouldn't be anywhere close to as good as a professional videographer. But the point was I didn't, that wasn't what the company needed. We needed somebody to be good enough to have like move us forward. And I was able to pull off the shoot and the, there was a couple extra things that the design team had to do in post-production because I made a couple of mistakes, but I think overall it worked and it was successful. And I wouldn't have not known where to start if I didn't have any tips. So this concept of baseline proficiency, I think is, is really key because it allows you to step a bit outside your comfort zone and do things that you maybe would have thought you weren't able to do before. There are actually a lot of things today that seem hard, but are actually very easy, thanks to AI. Looking through reams of information and spotting trends, this is something that is very tedious to do, very difficult if you're just staring at an Excel spreadsheet. Role-playing high-stakes situations, um, if you're deciding to promote or let somebody go at your work. Um, these are situations you don't really want to mess up, and to be able to run through it and practice beforehand can be, can be pretty helpful. Humans learn great by analogy. So explaining one concept to someone who knows another concept is, um, is powerful, but it can be hard to like get that right. And I feel like we're just kind of starting at the cusp of these things that are creating more opportunities and making things that used to be impossible or very difficult, at least um, relatively easy to do today. I have um, a friend of mine who told me that he was able to pay back his, um, his chat GPT subscription because he downloaded his bank statements, uploaded it to ChatGPT and said, hey, I'm trying to uh, live on a budget here. Um, are there any um, subscriptions that you feel like I should look at and maybe considering canceling? And he was able to find that he had Netflix and Hulu and a couple of things like that where he was able to pay for the subscription fees by pointing out um, things that he had, that he was actually subscribing to. 
So things like listen to every lecture by a renowned speaker. What are their main points that they tend to make? Look at these large reams of data. Is there anything unusual that's standing out? These things are very tedious and very complicated and take a lot of time as humans, but humans with a co-pilot that are able to do these things faster are um, kind of the, the new way of work. If you do a simple Google search for most anything nowadays, you'll get millions of results. What if you could look at all of those things and synthesize just the best points for what you're trying to do? Interactivity that's enabled by AI allows these systems to better represent the broad ranges of skills and broad ranges of perspectives and give you that information there. So the promise is that we're not going to have to scroll down to page seven or eight for a particularly uh, esoteric Google result, that we can use AI to put the right information in front of us. And there are some tools at the end that I can share for some, some practical things that I've personally used. Kind of the flip side of that is that AI frees up drudgery so humans can focus on higher value activities and not have to get as caught up in the details. This allows us to be more creative, think more about where we want to take our businesses next, and less so about just keeping the lights on. And the key point that I wanted to bring an end on is that AI allows for economic value to be tied to what was created, not the effort that's put in. I mentioned at the start of this call that I've recently written a book. And shortly after launching that book, we started getting a lot of requests for an audiobook. A lot of people had commutes, um, like to listen at 2x speed, like to summarize, and uh, they just felt it was helpful to have an audiobook come in. And I don't personally uh, consider myself to be a gifted narrator. So I um, was looking for someone who could help narrate the book for me. And I didn't have to look too far. Um, one of my employees at Yumbo uh, used to be a professional actor before switching over to become a software engineer. And she agreed to help me out and uh, to narrate the audiobook. And I think it went pretty well. We decided, um, learned a lot of different things I thought was pretty interesting. Turns out when you're narrating an audiobook, you shouldn't pack your day. Um, you should only do like three to four hours because your vocal cords start to get tired and you don't want that to come up in the book. So um, initially I was thinking like, cool, we'll just have like a binge day where we do this for 10 hours and be done. But turns out if you're a professional, you, you do three, four hours a day over the course of several days. And that way, no matter what chapter you listen to, it sounds fresh. So we went through all that, got a professional studio, um, had a audio engineer properly mix it and all of that, launched it. And um, we're a global company. We've got folks, clients and employees kind of all over the world. And we started getting requests for audiobooks in other languages. Now this posed a particular challenge because I only speak English. I kind of tapped out my network, got lucky that I had somebody in my network who knew how to do this in the US. I don't have contacts in Germany and Italy and France, all these other language uh, countries who are getting requests for different languages in. And um, we're able to come up with something that worked for everybody. So we ended up um, training an AI model on the actress's voice. Um, but the way we went about it is something that uh, is kind of like a new model of work. And that is, she went to school for this. She studied theater, she studied drama, she had taken voice acting classes. I would argue she spent maybe four to five years of her life making her voice a valuable asset that somebody would want to use in an audiobook. And when we trained the AI model on her voice, we were able to synthesize books in her voice, but in a language that she didn't speak. And it didn't take her any extra time to do that. She had already spent all the time in the studio recording the book in English. She just gave permission and rights and all of these kind of intangibles to create this new AI model, synthesize the, uh, the language model, generated in new languages. And now we have, um, I have a clip I can play after this and hopefully the audio works out with Zoom. But when I first showed it to her, she said she had shivers down her spine, hearing herself speak in a language that she doesn't actually speak. And we had ethical disclosure guidelines. So if you look at these books, um, it says that it's in the voice of Haley Hansard narrated by AI. So we're upfront and we, we explain where we use AI. We're not burying it. But the kicker is she was able to negotiate a rate um, based on the books that are sold. Where the traditional way to do this is there's usually a rate that you pay per word 
um, or so many dollars for so many thousand words, or you can do it hourly. But for the first time, thanks to AI, we're creating something where, again, the alternative is nothing. I didn't know anybody in these other countries. I wouldn't have been able to pull it off and to generate these books in other languages without AI. And the person who put in the effort is able to get some upside based on what we created. We've got books in 20 different languages now, but we didn't have to spend 20 months in the studio recording language after language after language. So I'm going to go ahead and try to... Um, try to play this and see if it comes through. But if it doesn't work, I can drop the, the link in the YouTube video. It's just like a 60 second or so video that, um, that gives an example of a bunch of the different languages. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll put something in the chat. I think I need to switch my AirPods off to uh, get the audio to come out of the uh, speaker so you can all hear it. Can you all still hear me now? Thumb up, cool. I think that means we're on the we're on the right mic. So let me do this. Oops. This is not. Sorry, give me like uh, ten more seconds to fidget with IT stuff, and then I'll move on if it doesn't work. Come on, seriously? I muttered. Oop, we lost it again. It's worth it, I promise. <laughs> Come on, seriously? I muttered, my hand slamming down on the desk in frustration. My co-founder glanced over his shoulder at me and slipped on his headphones so he could continue his work in peace. I had been at this for a few weeks and hadn't shown much progress yet. A full solemn dam and the shape may wash them. Urunun ik surumunu, Vikacha yonja bosharila de vea al. Nis gives us not make for the books and a manager at Fletcher, if Jahnuna Bushnake shops for Kino Prodokes for your robotum. Yo had a sis lap made a hair in Uravet for, Chista Volaborando da Falke Settimana, on pan of Nich se white the common. And set the same cop telephone off, in for the two for my sentimental, after the planification. Tínhamos implementado com sucesso a nossa primeira versão funcional do produto alguns meses antes. I think the key of all that is we're just two people. We didn't have a big publishing company behind us and the alternative there is we wouldn't have, just wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think it's a great illustration about generally how AI is changing the world is that it's a very powerful tool. There are a lot of things that we can do today that we couldn't do before. But if you look at the nature of how AI is changing things, it's accelerating individual tasks. And most of our job is not just one task. So we still need the humans. And if everyone does this, as a society, we can be more informed, more prepared, more thorough, more compassionate, more confident, because we've used these agents to kind of help us um, go into the world and think things through a little bit more, be more productive. Um, I talked a lot in general generalities today. So if you wanted to try some different things and take them back into your workflows afterwards, um, here are some tools. Again, I'm not like commissioned around any of these. These are just like as a, as a supporter, things that I've tried out and I've had success with. Um, I've had good luck um, preparing for a big presentation. If you use ChatGPT on the phone app, they have a voice mode. You can put your AirPods in, go for a walk, and kind of have a conversation with it going back and forth. And when you come back to your desk, the transcripts are all there in the machine. So if you want to go prepare for a presentation, you don't have to sit at your desk and like um, slog away at it. You can go out on a walk and look like you're slacking off, but you're actually being very productive. And I've just found for creativity, that's been, that's been pretty helpful. Um, there's a tool called Consensus where it uses the ChatGPT style large language model for searching, but it gives you scientific papers. So if you're looking for um, like general scientific questions, 
it'll help you pop up the right paper. And it basically solves the hallucination problem where AI gives you something that sounds really compelling but is actually incorrect. Is it's basically like an AI assisted search engine for academic research. Cohesive is a tool for um, assisting writing. If you want to, um, if you need help uh, coming up with blog post ideas or maybe making LinkedIn posts or um, keywords, you can have it not just help you write, but also give feedback and ask it questions about things that um, you're trying to achieve. And I feel like that's pretty key where we don't want to live in a society where we just don't think and have AI just spit things out for us. But you can upload like a draft that you put in there and say, hey, imagine that you disagreed with the statement. What are some holes that you would poke in the argument? And then you can think about how you want to incorporate that and like have a more well-rounded uh, piece at the end of, at the end result of it. Um, in the in the speech world, there's whisper transcription, which is helpful for turning speech into text. So if you want to go ask ChatGPT to summarize your meeting notes or things like that, you can. And the tool that we used for the um, for the audiobook is called Eleven Labs. I've also had friends use it for um, like training videos, voiceovers, podcasts, um, editing and narrations. So scenarios where you typically maybe be dissuaded from even making whatever you have in mind because you know you have to go get out the microphone, set everything up, record it. Um, and by making the making that more accessible, I think we can we can make and do more things. A lot of tools out there in terms of creating images and videos. Um, my personal experience is you're still going to have to do a video shoot for very particular things. But if you want like some B-rolls, you want some cutscenes, I think for these kinds of things, it works reasonably well on. Um, but at the end of it all, I think um, AI is certainly changing the world, but I'm optimistic. And I think the things that it's creating is certainly bigger than the things that it's taking away. And that these examples and these use cases, these scenarios we went through, I can't imagine them ever coming along or ever being possible unless you had some technical change that brought it about. So that's why overall I'm I'm bullish. I've been working in the AI industry for about seven, eight years now. And just the pace of change of what I've seen in the past two, three years has um, really picked up. And I feel like it's giving us all an opportunity to rethink the way things get done and to leave the world in a better place than we found it. So thank you all for coming here today and wanted to make sure I had some time at the end for, for any questions that people may have. Sack, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. That was really, really good. Um, have we got any questions for Sack at all? Let's, it may just be me, but I can't hear. Let me uh, Let me see if I can switch over. There you go. Really, really good, Sack. Thank you very much for that. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear now. Thank you. Excellent. Have we got any um any questions for Sack this evening? I think uh, you're in the morning, aren't you? Uh, where you are currently, Sack. Yeah, bright and early for me. Almost lunchtime. <laughs> Gary. Uh, Zach, that was really, really cool. And when you said about doing a book and doing voiceover, you was absolutely flawless all the way through. God knows how you memorised. I know you was reading uh, some of it, but it was really good. A couple of points from your presentation, yeah? One is, I believe that AI learns only from things that exist at the moment, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and this is just a, an idea. Will it start using people to get more information like uh could you could you see it where you go on chat gbt and you get paid to actually answer questions and give answers back so that was uh one thing see come in the other thing is is you defend ai a lot and i don't mm. know whether you have to defend it and what i mean by that is it's like cryptocurrency and blockchain etc they got in such a rut of keep on saying it's coming but it's not going to hurt anyone don't worry about it that eventually everyone gets scared of it. So mm -hmm. as a branding, do you think that maybe AI should step back and not defend itself so much? Yeah, well, I certainly don't think pop culture has helped. Um, we've got Terminator, we've got Howl, and I feel like uh, that kind of makes you start on a on a negative footing. At Yumbo, um, we've found that uh, if you mention, hey, we do this job with AI, um, at least in a B2B context where you're selling other businesses, you get a lot of fear. People assume, thanks to Hal and thanks to Terminator, that it's, again, they miss the point that it's zero sum or not zero sum. And if you log into the Yumbo software, 
we actually pretty early on hired a full-time designer so that we're able to have um, easy onboarding, um, rounded corners, playful icons, playful animations. Because the point all along was that it would be a co-pilot that would help you close more business, grow your business. It's not a zero-sum tool that like makes the person irrelevant. And I feel like um, it's sort of the elephant in the room. You bring it up and people sometimes get defensive. So we found focusing more on the outcomes of what you're able to do, having a 24-7 sales agent, being able to spend your time building rapport with the customers and not counting how many boxes it's going to take to pack these things up. Those things are much more compelling than just saying, hey, you'll be able to be X percent faster. Thanks to AI. So I've got a question. Um, I re-listened yesterday to your podcast with the Let's, Let's Talk Startup uh, mm -hmm. guys. It was very, very good. And something that keeps coming up is using AI in sort of traditional and unsexy industries, something that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to be a lot of opportunity out there at the moment where as founders or entrepreneurs, you're looking at uh, certain areas to disrupt. Um, and with this technology available now, there, there is so many industries out there that can be disrupted and can be made more efficient and a better uh, experience for the, the client. Do you think we've got much further to go with that at all, Zach? Yeah, I think there are certainly, I think AI use cases have a marketing problem, in my opinion. And that is there are a relatively small number of use cases that kind of suck all the oxygen out of the room. And everybody wants to talk about drones and self-driving cars. But I feel like the possibilities of what we're able to accomplish are way more far reaching than that. And um, I didn't want to go and start a company that was going to be like one out of 10,000 trying to make a self-driving car or truck when so many other people are focusing on it. And I feel like a lot of the problems and use cases that AI is really able to help improve, um, the people that know about it don't necessarily know those workflows. And as a result, they get overlooked. Um, but that's why I'm really excited about these things like ChatGPT. It's really easy to try out. Uh, the free version is, is pretty good. And um, you can go back to your desk and you can try different things out. And I think this is going to make a permeation of uh, these AI technology coming into all these different industries. So, I mean, even six, seven years ago, starting Yembo, we had to train our own AI model to be able to bring AI into this industry. That's a huge barrier of entry that I think most people um, would get disqualified over. But in terms of um, being able to dabble and try it out and kind of find where that um, co-pilot concept of uh, you still have a human in the loop, someone's still making decisions, but the individual tasks that it takes to do a job, you can accelerate certain ones of those with AI. I think that model you'll see going in a lot of different directions, just because when AI makes mistakes, it doesn't make a mistake like a human would. If you look at these AI generated images, there'll be a person smiling with three front teeth or a hand with seven fingers. Like it messes up in ways that humans never would. And that's why you can't be totally hands off and just say, okay, well, I'm not going to have any marketing people. I'm just going to do all of my uh, like go to market efforts on, on AI. You'll fail out of the gate. But if you're able to be more effective and be more efficient and um, have a person in the loop that's able to kind of outsource some of the more tedious parts, I think that's where things get really exciting and use cases where you may write yourself off beforehand and say, you know what? I don't have a 10 person team. I'm not even going to try to do that. It's like, what if you could do that? What if you could reconsider? And I think that's where things get really exciting, especially as a relatively small startup myself, like being able to go and be more ambitious and go tackle on things you wouldn't otherwise. When I get out of bed in the morning, it's, it's exciting. Thanks, Zach. Gideon. Uh, thank you, Zach. That was really interesting. I think I'm a little bit overwhelmed to think of uh, a, a clever or an interesting question. Only, you know, I guess what I'd like to know is if you could recommend uh, for a non-technical person who's someone who's kind of interested in keeping up to date with, you know, the, the new things that are coming out of AI, I, I guess I'd kind of put myself in that kind of early mainstream bucket. You know, are there any particularly good um, blog posts or sub stacks? I think you mentioned you have a sub stack. You know, is is that something you can put in the chat? Uh, I, I feel like I need to follow sure. some people that, that can help me sort of sure. go. Sure, I mean, um, 
you seem to be teeing me up for like a shameless plug for myself. I do try to. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll certainly give you that opportunity. Um, <laughs> so I can share that there. There are also some, uh, if you look at my recent posts, there are a few other people that I've um, like highlighted. I get most of my mm -hmm. information on LinkedIn just because I found that when somebody comes up with something, they usually talk about it there because it's like work related. Um, yeah. So I think there cool. are. Um, there are a few, there's a machine learning journal. Um, I posted an article about there recently where they focus more on um, use cases. Also, Yan LeCun, he's the head of the AI research lab for Facebook, um, I guess Meta now. Um, he posts a lot on um, the outcomes that come from it. So it's not just like an academic paper and you have to like get a PhD to understand what he's trying to say. They have like demo videos and they show the kinds of things that are coming out of it. And Facebook's taken a really interesting approach to going to market where they open source a lot of things. So they'll actually share the source code, they'll share the algorithms. Um, and that makes it easy for other people to like build on top of. I think if you want to follow him as well, he's, um, they're doing kind of state of the art research, cutting edge stuff, but it's also very like digestible in a single headline to kind of read, watch a quick video, see what's going on. That sounds can, perfect, thank you. Profile and send it to. Thank you. And, and thanks for taking us through that. That was really interesting. Thanks, Gideon. I mean, it's all, all that's left to say now is a big thank you uh, to you, Seth. You're going to get a lot of love and big ups and respect on LinkedIn tomorrow. Um, so, um, yeah, be be ready for that. It's going to be uh, it's, it's going to be good. So, um, no, I want to thank you. Very, very grateful for doing what you did uh, this evening or your time. Um, so brilliant, brilliant work. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all for coming. If you think of anything, have any questions, don't be a stranger. You know how to reach me. Ah.